good evening again, and I'm Barbara Ballard, and I'm one of the associate directors here at the Dole Institute for civic programming and for outreach. It is a pleasure to have you here this evening for our program with uh, Sheila Bear. Again, I want to say welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. We're very honored to have Sheila Bear this evening and to introduce her. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend and my colleague, Jonathan Earl. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, before I get begin, get begin with my remarks, I'd also like to thank uh, Brian and Barbara King for making this evening uh, possible with a generous financial gift. So thank you, Kings. Uh, as many of you know, the annual Dole Lecture commemorates the events of April 14, 1945, when a young officer named Bob Dole was critically wounded in Italy during the final days, hours really, of World War II. The lecture honors his courageous recovery and service to the nation by bringing to campus a distinguished national figure to discuss current politics and policy. In an era where people claim to be more skeptical than ever that government works, or even works most of the time, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation just plain defies public opinion. Since the FDIC's inception 75 years ago during the Great Depression, not a single depositor has lost money on insured deposits, which now cover accounts up to $250,000. That's a remarkable history given the financial chaos our country has been through, especially over the past 18 months. And while official Washington is bickering over how to reform our financial system and prevent another meltdown, tonight's guest and her able staff of public servants are busy right now I'd be willing to bet, planning the next round of bank shutdowns that have occurred every Friday for almost two years. You'd be excused if you hardly noticed that so far this year, federal regulators have shut down 50 banks, taken them briefly into receivership, divested them of their bad assets, and returned healthy assets to the private sector, usually by 9 o'clock Monday morning. Again, most people would never have noticed that, say, Riverside National Bank has become part of the TD Bank Financial Group, as happened last weekend. ATMs still work, paychecks still get deposited, interest earned on savings accounts gets added. Many people have suggested that this type of orderly, efficient, and paid for system could be used to get rid of too big to fail financial institutions, once and for all. If you're one of those people, feel free to write your congressman or senator. Tonight's Dole Lecture, Sheila Bear is an unusual figure in today's Washington. Although she has no formal training as an economist, she has worked on and off as a financial regulator in Washington for nearly two decades. In 2006, President George W. Bush appointed her to run the FDIC for a five-year term, and it's an office, I don't think this is insulting anybody, usually held by an anonymous bureaucrat. Yet the current chairman has forced her way to the center of the debate over the financial crisis in meaningful ways. Advisors with ties to New York banks have dominated both the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and Bear has consistently stood out for her skepticism of Wall Street and for her eagerness to confront the big banks. A Kansas Republican, she has become an unlikely hero to many uh, people on the other side of the aisle, many of whom see her as a counterweight to the more Wall Street-centric view often on display in the Treasury Department, a pro-consumer and pro-regulation capitalist hero. She has pressed for more structural changes at banking behemoths like Citigroup, urged President Obama to toughen his position on regulation, and like Elizabeth Warren of the Congressional Oversight Panel to investigate last year's bank bailouts, the TARP. She has not been afraid to take her disagreements public. Sheila Bear was born in Independence, Kansas, the daughter of a nurse and a doctor who took public service seriously and served on the local school board. Like Senator Dole, both of Bear's parents grew up during the Great Depression. Sheila Bear studied philosophy here at KU and also graduated from our fine law school. During her time in Lawrence, the chairman worked briefly as a teller at a local bank, like the ones that make up the bulk of the FDIC's 8,000 strong membership. In 1981, Chairman Bear took a job working for Bob Dole on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And after the 1984 elections made Dole majority leader, he appointed her to increasingly important positions in his office, including research director, deputy counsel and counsel to the Senate Majority Leader. As Dole's research director during his 1988 presidential campaign and as an unsuccessful candidate for Congress two years later, Bear received an intense 
education in local politics. The next year, she took a job with the Commu Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which regulates commodity futures and option markets. This provided her a front row seat for how the anti-regulatory regime of both Democrats and Republicans at the time had a real world effect and not always a good one. She's taken her experiences to academia as well, where she's been the Dean's Professor of Financial Regulatory Policy for the Eisenberg School of Management at UMass Amherst since 2002. While there, she also served as the, on the FDIC's Advisory Committee on Banking Policy. Chairman Baer topped the Wall Street Journal's annual 50 Women to Watch list in 2008, and in both 2008 and 2009, Forbes magazine named her the world's second most po powerful woman after uh, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel. She has received several honors for her published work on financial issues, inclu including educational writings for her uh, on money and finance for children and for professional achievement. I, I want to actually call attention to her two children's books, Rock, Brock, and the Savings Shock, published in 2006, and her second, Isabel's Car Wash, in 2008. My nieces love these books. Again, I don't know where financial reform is going to end up, but we are extremely fortunate to have with us this evening a member of the extended Dole family and a relentless public advocate for our side, the consumer side, to tell us more. Please help me welcome to the stage Chairman Sheila Baer. Chairman Bear, we are so delighted that you could join us here at the Dole Institute tonight. Yeah, I'm happy to be here, Chris. Yeah, back, back on campus at KU, you were a student here. Uh, you graduated from uh, uh, philosophy major, also from the law school. What were your days here at KU like, and what kind of lasting impact did that have on you? Well, um, they were busy days. They were good days. And I have very uh, fond memories here. It's a beautiful campus and a great faculty, uh, great fellow students. I've had a chance to see many of them uh, here during my visit uh, today. So, you know, I think I got a really good education in Kansas University. I'm a product of public schools. I went through uh, my entire life. I went through public schools, and I think it served me well. And uh, again, very, very fond memories. What would you say uh, what was the most exciting thing that happened while you were at KU? Let's see, I think probably getting in a cardboard box and sledding down the hill into Potter's Pond when it was uh, <laughs> <laughs> Had a few bruises to show over that tomorrow, the, the next morning. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun campus too. Uh, and uh, we did our share of uh, college uh, shenanigans uh, uh, with uh, everyone else, but, uh, but it was good hearted fun. Now, you had a variety of very interesting roles with Senator Dole. Talk about how you eventually went to work for him, how you wound up working for him, and, and some of the things that you did with him over the years. Well, um, I'm a lifelong uh, Kansas Republican, and actually, I remember uh, as a student here, one of my not-so-happy memories, I went to, it was during the, you know, the, uh, towards the waning years of the Vietnam War, and Senator Dole was invited to speak. And um, he, was, uh, he was booed off the stage. Uh, it, it was very unpleasant. Uh, there was a lot of tumult, a lot of unhappiness with the student body. And, and in retrospect, I understand that. But you know, his office deserved respect, um, as, you know, uh, as did others. So um, that, uh, I wrote him a letter of, of apology uh, as a student here. And uh, he remembered that, believe it or not. And then later, I was an attorney with the old Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, I'll show you how old I am. And I was working in the, uh, uh, the general counsel's office. I had been uh, in, in Washington, and the Department of Education split off from the old HEW. And uh, I, I was going to go with the Department of Education, and I thought that was a little uh, more narrowly uh, focused than I wanted to be. So it just uh, um, on a whim, I contacted his office to see if he had any openings, and he did on the Senate Judiciary Committee, which was right up my alley because I had practiced primarily civil rights law with HEW. And he was on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and this was in the early 80s right after President Reagan had been elected, and Strom Thurmond, the Republicans had uh, gotten control of the Senate, and Strom Thurmond was the chairman of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. He had replaced uh, Ted Kennedy, and obviously that was a big sea change, and especially on civil rights issues, and there were some key civil rights issues, most importantly the Voting Rights Act extension coming up in 1982. So I think then Senator Dole realized he would need to play somewhat of a brokering role on, on that, and, and was looking for someone with some civil rights background. And, but he remembered the letter I'd written uh, to him, which I said something about a good politician, right, that he would remember that letter. So uh, 
he hired me, and it was uh, the start of a, a great uh, career here in the Senate working uh, working for him, and it's really served me well throughout my whole life. What were the what were the two or three roles that, that you enjoyed the most working with him? Because you had quite a few, yeah. actually. Well, I think he was a master legislator. I mean, uh, the Voting Rights Act is a good example. That was a very, very difficult issue. The, the committee was very polarized on that. And he really was able to broker a compromise uh, and, and bridge the gap. And we got the, uh, the bill out of committee on a very strong vote. And then it passed the floor on a very strong vote. And, uh, and he just worked it. Uh, he, you know, he had always had a good policy sense, but he, he knew the parameters of, of flexibility for a good compromise, too. And he didn't really care who took the credit, either. I think that was also one of the, uh, the, the secrets of his success, is who's happy to, you know, if it got him the votes, if it got him the deal, who's happy to have somebody else go do the press conference and give them the credit. And, um, and I saw him do that over and over again, not only as uh, chairman of both the, the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee as well as the Senate Finance Committee at that time, but then as he became majority leader later. So uh, he, uh, you know, and I think he was a great politician, too. He could work a crowd. Well, he was a master and remembered. It was, you know, because it was sincere. Uh, he would remember people. Um, he would, I remember whenever I'd travel with him, uh, we'd always take names, and everybody would get a personal note uh, afterwards. Uh, he just really liked people. I think that's a sign of a good politician. It was genuine. He had a genuine uh, concern and respect and compassion for the people of Kansas. And every time I came out here with him, it really showed. How did working for him influence you both professionally and personally? Well, I think um, he, uh, I, I, he showed me how to be independent. I mean, as uh, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and then later as a majority leader, he had every lobbyist in town constantly at his doorstep. And he really didn't care. I mean, he didn't. He would always listen to all sides. He wanted to know what the lay of the land was. But he, I never saw him be influenced by any particular interest, uh, unless it was a Kansas interest. But I mean, by that, I mean a general uh, Kansas interest. Um, so, you know, I, that was important to me, uh, that he did, uh, he'd listen to everybody, he always gave uh, open access, but then he'd just do what uh, he thought was right. He was very independent in that way. And, uh, and I had a lot of respect for that, because I think Washington, you are constantly buffered uh, by various competing interests and this and that. And unless, uh, y and you can't deal with that well unless you have your own grounding and understand, okay, these people want me to do this, or they want me to do that, and fine, I'm going to listen to everybody. But at the end of the day, I'm going to do what I think is in the public interest, and I'm going to, I'm going to hear everybody, or I'm going to go out for public comment if it's rulemaking, and we're going to do just with what, is, what is right. And, um, and he did that over and over again. And it, it sounds kind of trite, I guess, but it's really true. that The minute you start trying to do favors for people or get in league with one, one faction over another, that's, that's when you get yourself in trouble, and, that, and that's when you've lost your miss, mission as a public servant. I really think that's true. After working with the senator in a variety of roles, you decided to throw your hat into the ring uh, personally. Tell us right. a little bit about that congressional campaign I back did. in 1990. I did. Uh, we were joking about this earlier. He had uh, actually, I was, uh, I was working for the New York Stock Exchange at that point, and um, he, uh, my home district of Kansas, the old Kansas 5th in southeast Kansas, was opening up. And uh, I've always had, uh, the, my, my term with the New York Stock Exchange was pretty my only uh, short term is in the private sector. I've, I've pretty much always been a public servant at heart. And so he, uh, he brought the seat to my attention and we went in and talked about it and he encouraged me to go out there. And I said, well, I had no idea how to do that. And he said, well, why don't you just go out and talk to all the county Republican chairmen and see what they have to say. I said, okay. So I went out there, I made appointments with all of them and drove you know, county to county and met with all of them and asked them what they thought of the race and whether I'd have a chance. You know, I was a native Kansan, grew up in Independence, Kansas, but I'd been in Washington for several years, most of that working for Senator Dole, but nonetheless, I had been in Washington for several years. And they all encouraged me, said they thought the race was well wide open and then I would have a shot. So I came back and kind of reported back to me, said, oh yeah, you, yeah, you should do it. So I quit my job, <laughs> moved back home with my parents. <laughs> I was in my late 30s at that point. And uh, I decided to run for Congress, and it was it was quite it was quite a um, quite an experience. But I'm very glad I did it uh, because uh, you know it's re it was retail politics is its best. I mean, Southeast Kansas. Some of you are from Southeast Kansas. It's a strong newspaper tradition. William Ellen White, Emporia Gazette, and I love going from town to town and just speaking with the local newspaper editor. It was just it was just my idea of fun. I also did a door-to-door -door campaign, so I got on my bicycle because I found out I could go to houses faster if I went on, got on my bicycle. So I had a little yellow flag on my bicycle so everybody would see me, and I'd go from house to house. And if somebody was there, I'd go in and chat. 
about this and that. If they weren't there, I'd hang a flyer on their door, letting them know that I was there with a personal note. And I, keep track, I kept track of every single house that I visited and targeted uh, Repu registered Republicans who had voted in the last primary. It was, a, it was a safe Republican seat. It was a primary seat. And probably, oh, I don't know, five or 6,000 houses probably before it was all said and done. And then they got follow-up correspondence from me, and uh, we, you know, we maintained close contact with those people I had personally seen. And I also found it had a nice multiplier effect because uh, all these small towns in southeast Kansas, you know, some woman on her bicycle going door to door was kind of a news item. So, you know, in the coffee clutches and the hair salons or whatever the next day, I'd, you know, people would be talking, oh, did you know that Sheila Bear was in town? And uh, I had a great time. And I lost, I lost, oh, I came so close. It was 1%, 760 votes. And, you know, it's, it's better, I think, in a political, it's the only time I ran for office. I worked on some of the Senator Dole's campaigns. It was the only time I did it myself. And campaigns are very intense, and then when they're over, it's just like hitting a brick wall at 90 miles an hour. It's like, boom, you wake up the next day, you don't have a campaign to go to anymore. And uh, when you lose by less than 1%, I mean, you second guess yourself a lot. And so um, I dealt with that for a little bit, but then I got uh, philosophical about it and realized it had just been a really fun experience and a wonderful experience and a, a way to uh, connect with, with people and learn something about the, uh, the political process and gave me a new understanding of what members of Congress have to do with the, especially in the House with the, this two-year cycle, every two years needing to run for re-election. So I'm, I'm very glad I did it, and I, and I thank him. I, I was a little upset with him when he first got me into it, because they didn't even endorse me because it was a contested primary. And, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm glad in retrospect he didn't, because it was, uh, I think, doing it on my own. I think I earned some respect in doing that. And then after the campaign was over, of course, he was second-guessing himself. Oh, if I'd endorsed her, she would have gotten the votes, and we don't know if that would have happened or not. But it was just, it was just a great thing to do. You've been in public service almost your entire life. Uh, how did you get interested in public service? When do you remember a point at which you kind of made a conscious decision that's that that's what you wanted to do? Boy, um, that's a good question. I think I guess it was just a migration in my thinking. Um, I, uh, you know, I've always uh, um, uh, believed in government as a source of good, I still believe in government. I think a lot of people are disillusioned with their government right now, and I think some of that's justified, but I've always thought that, you know, um, government is, is, the role of government is to provide equal opportunity, never equal results, but equal opportunity. And it's, it's what makes this country great, is, is to guarantee, you know, people can get a good basic education, they can get access to a job, and you know, you give them the opportunities and they need to make of that what they will. But government does have the role of making sure those opportunities are there, and I, I think it's really at the core of of what our society is about. So I, I guess I've just, I've, I've always been attracted to government service in that sense. You got your start in um, uh, banking early. Right, right, that's you right. You were in you were in college <laughs> and you worked as a, at a, as a teller at a local bank. Did, I did. did how I did, did that influence yeah. seeing that happen, actually dealing with right. customers and all? How right. did that kind of influence your thinking about well, it was. banking? It was, that was actually, I worked for Archie Vaughn. He was at the uh, dinner earlier. I don't know if he's still here, Archie. How are you? If it, he was, it was an SNL, uh, and uh, I, was, I, had, uh, I graduated from college a semester early, and I had about nine months before the fall semester when law school started, and I didn't make some money, and, but I wanted to stay in Lawrence, I didn't want to move, uh, so I, I got a job as a bank teller, and um, it was an amazing experience. It was hard work, I'll tell you that. Uh, I think I got paid $350 a month. <laughs> And uh, that was five days a week plus Saturday mornings. Uh, so, um, boy, those were the days, huh? So uh, it certainly taught me something about, you know, budgeting. You know, I was pretty much, I was trying to save as much of this as I could. And so I lived on a very austere budget. Actually, I got a second job uh, to, to, uh, to make even more money to, to get a little bit of a, more of a, uh, a cash pile before I started law school. Uh, it was hard work, but I enjoyed it. There was a lot of uh, personal interface. And those were the, you know, those were great days of banking. Um, you know, people would come in. There was a little passbook savings account. Everybody remembers those. And people would come in. They would come in personally to make their mortgage payment every month. You know, boy, those are good old days, too. Was such pride in coming in every month and making that mortgage payment or coming in with their kids with their dollar or two that they want to put in their savings account and getting their passbook stamped. And it was, you know, it was old-fashioned old -fashioned banking at its best. And I hope, you know, as we come out of this crisis, we'll, we'll reacquaint ourselves a bit with some of those values of taking pride in and, 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 you know, and, and not borrowing unless you need to, and then taking pride in repaying the debt and saving, you know, saving. We really lost uh, that savings culture that our depression era parents and grandparents had, had handed down to us. So I'm hoping, as bad as this financial crisis has been, that we're, we're reacquainting ourselves with some of those traditional values that, that I saw, uh, you know, every day at, at that savings and loan. 
in 2001, you were serving as Assistant uh, Secretary at the Treasury, and you actually noticed that early some practices that later on very clearly had a major role in the financial meltdown. Tell us a little bit about that, what you saw and what concerned you. Well, it was, it was interesting. I was at Treasury in 2001 and 2002, and um, I had, when I was up for Senate confirmation, um, I had had a courtesy meeting with the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, Paul Sarbanes at the time, and Senator Sarbanes represented Maryland, and there had been some terrible problems in some of the uh, inner city neighborhoods in Baltimore of, of what was called loan flipping. And these were uh, terrible practices where people would come in, uh, they would actually uh, look for folks in these neighborhoods where people had equity in their homes, and then give them a very high cost uh, payment shock loan, something that had maybe a low teaser rate, but then would reset severely. And they were designed really to, to so people couldn't repay them when they were resetting. And so uh, they, would, they would do this, and then they would, uh, and then they would, they, frequently the loan would result in a foreclosure because the people couldn't make the loans and then the loan reset, and then they would take the property and flip it. That was why it was called flipping. So he was, this has been going on in, in Baltimore, and uh, so, uh, but, but that was very egregious, but there was, we were already starting then, uh, the spread of, of, of uh, similar kind of practices by some, they were non-banks, not, not insured imposter institutions, but there are, you know, mortgage brokers and, and uh, you know, smaller finance companies that would make these uh, stiff payment shock loans with very high rates, and that you know they were whole just just premised on the idea that you would have to refinance in a year or two, and then there'd be a whole because you couldn't afford the reset, right? So then you'd have to refinance the loan again, and there'd be a whole new bunch of fees. If you couldn't refinance, you'd get a foreclosure, and they'd be able to take the property. So um, it, it was it was a very bad practice. So anyway, Senator Sarbanes brought this to my attention because it's been going on in Baltimore, and he referred me to a report that the Treasury Department and the old Department of uh, Health, Edu uh, excuse me, uh, Housing and Urban Development had written on predatory lending. And so I read it and I talked to some of the career Treasury staff who had written it. And uh, then I got to know Ned Gramlich, who was a, a member of the Federal Reserve Board at the time, uh, who was also looking at this from the Fed's perspective. Uh, Ned had the consumer portfolio at the Fed. And, um, and we were getting concerned. And, uh, but then it was more, it was like, you know, kind of perimeter players, people out, you know, not main, mainstream lenders were not doing this. It was just more kind of these smaller, here one day, gone tomorrow kind of outfits. And it was much more of a consumer issue. So we tried to get a group of, of the mainstream lenders who we thought would, would you know, had issues uh, with uh, maintaining the reputation of the mortgage industry and trying to get these bad actors out. We tried to get them together along with the consumer groups. Um, to uh, develop a, a code of best practices. And the idea was to have, that address things like, you know, abusive prepayment penalties or negative amortization. Actually, to show how quaint it was back then, our best practices said you can't do negative amortization. That's just a bad, bad practice, this idea of, of having a mortgage where the payment is so low that you're actually building principal each month, right? Your loan balance is going up instead of down. A lot of people got, got trapped in those and, and they've been a terrible problem. So uh, we, we were able to, uh, to get a set of best practices, but you know, it just didn't, uh, that effort, that small effort could not uh, in any way overcome the strong economics that were already starting to feed this mortgage crisis. And I think a lot of it, you know, people blame the banks and are angry with the banks, and I get that, and I'm angry with some of the banks too. But I think in, in fairness to insured, insured banks, FDIC insured banks, those are the more heavily regulated institutions that most of this really did get started outside of what we call the non-bank sector, the shadow sector, which had less regulation. And as these loose lending practices started to proliferate, it did fall back into more highly regulated insured banks. They were losing market share uh, to these, uh, these uh, non-bank uh, providers. And of course, they, were, they didn't need deposits to fund their mortgages. They were going to these Wall Street securitization vehicles and getting money through securitization so they could bypass the banks completely. And of course, as I said, that created competitive pressure on the banks to start lowering their standards to, to get the market share back. So the whole thing just started spiraling down. But I was, you know, I left Treasury in 2002. I went to uh, University of Massachusetts in Amherst for four years to teach at the business school. I came back in the middle of 2006 to take this job. And uh, the staff at the FDIC were already looking at this and they were very concerned. And, and by that point, this, these uh, securitizations, we call them private label securitizations, 
the funding, Wall Street funding for these uh, very loosely uh, underwritten loans had just proliferated, just had ballooned. And so we decided to buy a database. And since they weren't on bank balance sheets, we really couldn't see what was in the loans, what they looked like. So we bought a database of, of loan. It was called the loan performance data to see what was in these securitizations. And we couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, uh, there are this terrible product called the 228s and 327s, also known as hybrid arms. And basically, it would start at very, very high. Even the starter rate was very high, typically like mine, 10%. And they were they were given to uh, they were heavily marketed in lower income neighborhoods, minority neighborhoods. You could see you go on maps, you could see how you know these certain neighborhoods have been targeted. They, the starter rates would be at eight or nine percent, and then they would reset. You know, could you know 30, 40 percent increase in your payment after a couple of years. Someone would have prepayment penalties in them that would go beyond the reset date. So if you tried to refinance out of this this steep payment shock, you get hit with a really big uh, prepayment penalties. And they were being, uh, they were very high loan to value ratios, uh, very high being underwritten. Borrowers getting these were spending like 50% of their income on the, just on the mortgage payment, which is far beyond what uh, a prudent uh, lender uh, would do. The standard is more like 30%. And then we also saw these other mortgages, uh, they're known as option arms or negative amortization products, where again, you, the, the starter period was longer, it was really uh, three to five years. But uh, they would have not only an interest rate reset, but again, they would, they would negatively amortize. So the payment you were making would be so low that your principal balance would actually be building. And uh, almost all of these, uh, well, not almost all of them, the majority of them, I would say, uh, were not, they didn't document income either. And there's a lot of evidence of, of mortgage brokers just filling in the documents for the borrowers and just, they just wanted to make the loan. And uh, so I couldn't believe it, that this, this really gun mainstream from 2001 to 2002, when it was kind of the perimeter, uh, small, some of the smaller outfits doing this, it had become mainstream. And, and uh, these big uh, Wall Street firms were funding this stuff, and all these big uh, mortgage finance companies were doing it. It was just amazing to me. And the whole, uh, the whole theory was the party would go on forever because home prices would keep going up. So even though it was an unaffordable mortgage, well, you could always just refinance them out, or if not, you could foreclose. And, and sell it at a higher price. And, um, and uh, well, the rest is history, as they say. Though as soon as some prices started uh, going down, uh, all these mortgages uh, started going bad. And, uh, and the, uh, you know, the, the economic damage has just been catastrophic. How, um, and how big of a role would you say in the subprime crisis did these practices take? Were they really critical in terms of creating the whole thing? I think they were. I think they were, um, they let it, they let it. I think uh, they were uh, symptomatic of, of larger problems, though, with uh, too much leverage. Both the you know consumers as well as uh, financial firms were taking on too much leverage. Um, we had uh, we were ignoring lending standards again because the securitization is basically a, a lender makes a loan and then sells it off to what's called the securitization trust, and a bunch of mortgages are packaged together, and those are divided up into securities and sold off to investors. Right, so. The point of this is when the lender made the loan, uh, traditionally a bank or a savings and loan would make the loan and hold it on their books. So if the loan went bad, they would have to take the loss. Well, with securitization, the loan would actually move off of their books into the securitization trust where theoretically the investors would take the loss if the loan went bad. So nobody was really paying attention. Um, and the fee structures on these were such that the originators would get a lot of volume-based fees. They would get uh, paid more, the more volume they did. They would get more based on high, how high the interest rate was, which I couldn't believe. It's called a yield spread premium. So actually, the worst job they did for you as a as a borrower, the higher the interest rate they could charge you, the bigger their their commission was when they sold these uh, mortgages off in the securitization trust. So um, it absolutely fed the beast. It created this huge housing bubble, uh, you know, because the whole thing was based on on the rising value of the collateral, the value, rising value of the home prices. So it just fed itself. So more credit. We kept pretty much anybody could get a loan, you know, at the, at the end of the, the frenzy. And that was just because the people thought the collateral was going to keep going up. But the more the credit was provided, the more demand for housing. And, and so the more the pressure on the home prices uh, was to go up. And then when the bubble burst, uh, it was uh, just catastrophic for everyone. But it absolutely was at the heart of the crisis and, and at the heart of the cause of the crisis. Looking back, mm -hmm. just, uh, just talking retrospectively, what should have been done differently? Well, you could identify yeah, two or three I things that would really right. kind of well, change the arc of the meltdown. I think we never should have uh, we never should have let lending standards deteriorate. 
And again, that way, part of the problem, part of the reason we're able, not able to contain or, or to maintain higher quality lending standards was because you had two sectors. You had a more regulated bank sector and you had an unregulated shadow sector. And as the, uh, and, and Congress did try to uh, uh, pass laws, there were really only two places that you could, two, two authorities that had the ability to apply lending standards across the board for both banks and non-banks. One was the Federal Reserve Board, and which is something that Ned Gramlich had pushed back then. They did have the authority under their consumer rulemaking authority to, to apply rules for both banks and non-banks, so they could have acted. They did not, or Congress could have passed uh, laws, and there was a lot of effort to try to pass anti-predatory lending laws, but they never could get anywhere. And I think that was because everybody, for a time, everybody was making money. Even borrowers were making money. As the home prices would go up, they could pull equity out, you know, get that cash out, kept refinancing. So a lot of borrowers were making money too. And it was just the economic, uh, the economic uh, rewards of this unaffordable lending were such that it was very, very hard to, to rein back. But I think, uh, you know, and I, you know, I'm pretty hawkish on, on uh, lending standards, but just, and it's not rocket science. Oh my gosh, document income, you know? Get the person's uh, tax return or their pay stubs, you know, and 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 uh, you know, look at if they paid bills before. You don't have to use a credit score; that's controversial. You can certainly check their credit history, you know. And, and not everybody is ready to buy a house uh, and make payments on a house. So if they don't have, you know, if they have a good record paying their utility bills and their rent sometime, then maybe they're ready to buy a house. But if they can't prove that kind of record, they're probably not ready for a mortgage yet, and, and it doesn't do them any favors to give them one. And make sure there's a little money down too. Make sure there's some skin in the game for the borrower too. That you know the the, uh, all the data shows that borrowers perform best on mortgages if they have put some money up front, that they've, you know, it shows a commitment to the house. So I think if we had, uh, we had done all those things, because uh, we didn't, this didn't help borrowers. This is, I mean, this is the tragedy of this is, the millions of people have lost their house, especially in some of these lower income neighborhoods, people that had equity in their house, that had owned these houses for years, got caught up in these equity refinance, you know, equity cash out refinance products, and they've lost homes that they had, you know, uh, for years, uh, not just recently, but for years, they lost them because they refinanced them to high, um, high cost mortgages that they couldn't pay. So I think lending standards really at the heart of it, and we continue to push the Fed on this. They had they have uh, applied uh, stronger lending standards for what you call subprime loans, those are the higher cost loans. But we continue to advocate for strong, these strong lending standards across the board. And again, it's not rocket science. It's just you know, documenting income, having some down payment, making sure the debt to income ratio is acceptable, more like, you know, a 30% as opposed to a 50%. Uh, those are not things that should be hard to do. But, uh, but I do worry that we don't really have these protections in place. And as the economy, you know, the good news is the economy may be coming back, and we all hope it is. But I worry that the party could start up again uh, if we don't put some better regulation in place uh, before, that, before that occurs. You've been an advocate of getting lenders to work right. uh, with uh, people having trouble meeting the terms of their loans rather than just going straight to foreclosure. Right. Uh, how have those efforts worked and how have they contributed to the, right. the health of the economy? Well, we've had, we've had pretty good uh, success with them with the FDIC's program. Uh, they're not a panacea, but we thought, you know, loan restructuring is a time-tested tool and the bankers in the room will know that. Uh, and at the FDIC, because we have to deal with banks when they fail, and we have to deal with their troubled assets, we found a long time ago that if you try to restructure loans, a loan that is not performing, you restructure it to get the, the borrower making payments again, that the, that the loan will be, uh, worth, will be worth more. And it's a good loss mitigation tool. It won't work for everyone. Uh, some borrowers will end up redefaulting. But generally, you're better off at least trying because, uh, you know, the delay, if, if, the home, if the housing market uh, continues to go down, uh, you might, uh, by trying to rework the mortgage, you might lose some money by having to delay foreclosure later on if it redefaults. But if the housing market is flat or even going up a bit, which is more uh, typical in, in areas of the country, you're still, even from a, a business perspective, you're in a better shape to try to rework that home and keep the borrower in their house and, and see if you can preserve the home and, and also uh, mitigate your losses. So we have done this with uh, our field bank assets and the, part, the people who buy uh, these mortgage loans from us as part of the field bank assets. We offer some percentage of loss share uh, to get a better price for these mortgages as we sell them to healthier banks and give them some credit protection. We also say if we're going to provide this loss share, we would like you to make sure that if the loan goes into default or becomes something like what you try to rework it, if you have a borrower that uh, has lost income or can't make their reset payment to try to rework it, 
And we've had pretty good success. Our rate of fault rates are about 30%, which sounds high, but you're saving 70%, and you're actually, and you're, you're saving yourself a lot of money, actually, with a redefault rate like that, because the loans you rehabilitate will save you a lot more money than any kind of incremental loss you might have later by delaying the foreclosure to see if you could get the loan reworking again. So, uh, you know, it, it's, we, uh, we have advocated, uh, I wish we'd gotten an earlier start. I think by the time this administration had launched its efforts, uh, there was such a huge backlog of, of non-performing loans and loans in the, in the foreclosure pipeline. It's very, very difficult. Once a borrower gets used to not making a payment for several months, it's very, very difficult to rehabilitate those mortgages. You really have to do it early in the process or, or your redefault rates will go up a lot. But So I think they had a, a big problem that they inherited when they came in. But I have, uh, and, and their program has met with mixed success, but I, I still think uh, it's worth trying. And uh, I think they have, uh, they have saved some, some homes, and I think we'll save more as the program gets under a better footing. Uh, but in, a, in terms of our programs, we've had very good success with it. We started hearing the phrase, too big to fail, right, back in, yeah. I think, 08. Right. You know, are there companies that are too big to fail, and, and what are the implications uh, of that? Well, I, I think, um, unfortunately, um, you know, some of these large financial institutions uh, had an implied government backstop before the crisis, and rating agencies actually gave them a higher rating because of the perception that the government would bail them out if they got themselves into trouble. And then, of course, when um, the crisis hit, and a number of them did get into trouble, uh, those, uh, those, uh, that implicit government guarantee became explicit. But I, I don't think the government, I know is controversial and outrageous as some of the bailouts were, I don't think that there really was an alternative because we didn't have, uh, with Lehman Brothers, you saw what happens with bankruptcy. Uh, the bankruptcy courts just really aren't equipped to deal with a very large financial intermediary. Lehman Brothers was by far the, the largest financial institution that ever went into bankruptcy. And it, it, caused, it caused massive uh, seizing up of the credit markets um, for, a variety of, uh, for a variety of reasons. The main one being that bankruptcy is a very abrupt process. So once you go into bankruptcy, pretty much everything stops. And uh, also, uh, people who have these derivatives contracts, if you read about so much, they get special protection in bankruptcy. So they can pull, they generally, when they have a derivatives, uh, contract uh, with the entity that is failing, they have collateral that supports that. And the bankruptcy rules give them the ability to pull all that collateral immediately out of the failing institution, which creates created a lot of disruption uh, with the Lehman Brothers uh, bankruptcy and was the reasons why we, we saw such a seizing up of the credit markets uh, after that event occurred. The FDIC has a different process, again, just for insured institutions. And most of these institutions you read about either were not banks or had significant activities outside of their insured banking uh, uh, entity. But under our process, um, we can require these derivatives counterparties to continue performing on their contracts. So they can't walk away and pull out their collateral. They have to continue to perform. It's our right to accept or repudiate those derivatives contracts. We also have the ability to set up something called a bridge institution. So we basically set up a new institution and we take the good assets, uh, the, the, the pieces of the, the failed institution that have franchise value and put them into this transitional operating entity. And we fund that on a short term basis as we break up the institution and sell it off. And you'll get a much better price if you're selling an operating entity as opposed to if you're selling an entity that's been liquidated. So it makes sense it maximizes recovery to provide some short term funding to keep the place afloat as, as, you, um, as you break it up and sell it off. But the shareholders and the unsecured creditors always absorb the, any losses that are attendant to that resolution. So that is our process. And it works well, and it's worked well for decades. But we couldn't use it because so much of this was outside of insured depositories. And even some of the major entities that did have large insured depository institutions within them, they had so much outside of them that you would have to run a bifurcated process with the bank over here and bankruptcy over there, and it just wasn't going to work. So the result was really was bailouts. We just didn't feel like we had any alternative. And the good news is it did stabilize the system, but the bad news is it made explicit uh, this implicit too big to fail uh, notion and, and rightfully caused a lot of public outrage. So we're trying to fix that in the Dodd bill now to, to provide for an FDIC style resolution, which is what small banks have to confront every Friday, as, as you've seen in the papers. So it's, this is something that's used for smaller institutions now. It's basically the same process, use it for larger institutions but create authorities to go outside the insured banks uh, to do it. And uh, the bill itself, which we pushed very hard, specifically says you may not bail out failing institutions going forward. The government can't do it. We can't do it. The Fed can't do it. The Treasury can't do it. Nobody can do that. 
We push for that language, and if they get in trouble, they go into this resolution, and their shareholders and their creditors take the losses. Taxpayers don't take exposure. So I think, I think if that becomes law, I don't know. I think some large institutions are still fighting it, um, and, uh, and I think they're fearful of being downgraded if it becomes, and there were some uh, ratings uh, agencies uh, that came out with reports suggesting that some institutions would be downgraded if this became law when the House passed this provision. The House has the same provision. So there's still a lot of industry resistance to it, and I don't know if we'll prevail, but, but I hope we do, because it's really um, this too-big-to-fail notion uh, creates, re it, it fed into the excessive risk-taking, because if shareholders and creditors, those who invest money uh, through debt or, or equity in these very large institutions, if they think they have all the upside, right, but if, if the place goes down, the government will take the downside, that creates incentives for risk. They want them to take higher risk to get the returns juiced up, and they feel like they can you know, the government will take, get, them, uh, get them out of trouble if they get into trouble. That, that feeds risk-taking, and it is absolutely an unacceptable uh, uh, situation that we have now. It's also like, grossly unfair to the smaller institutions. I mean, these large institutions, because of the perception of too big to fail, they can issue debt at very favorable terms, have to pay very low rate on the debt. It's easier for them to raise capital, much more easier, much easier than it is for the smaller institutions, which everybody knows uh, can fail. Uh, they also can, can uh, attract large uninsured deposits because people with a small institution will have to worry about whether they're above or below the insured deposit level, but for a large too big to fail institution, they figure, oh, well, you know, I can put millions of deposits in this big bank and the government's going to bail them out so I don't have to worry about it. And that creates uh, terrible competitive disparities for the smaller institution. It makes, means they have to pay more to keep deposits and ha they make, have a much harder time of keeping uninsured deposits. So this really needs to end, and we're hopeful that it does. I don't know. I think you know there's just a lot of pushback right now, and uh, also because of the technical nature of the legislation, it is subject. It lends itself to misrepresentation or misunderstanding, and we've seen that I think of the debate on this on this the re what we call the resolution authority now. So I'm hoping it'll go through, but I don't know if it will. You've had a lot of fascinating mm -hmm. uh, jobs in your career. What, which, if you had to pick one that you thought was the most rewarding or satisfying, right. yeah. oh, boy. current one or previous? Well, I think the current one probably just because um, we've been in the epicenter uh, of, of, of the storm. And uh, I'm very proud of the agency for the way, you know, things were, people were scared. I was scared. We were all scared um, in 2008. And, um, and I think after any Mac failed, uh, people were worried about their money, the safety of their money, even in insured banks. And, and we had a very vigorous uh, public education campaign, and we showed that where the bank fails, it really is a non-event for insured depositors. Your access to insured money is seamless. Nobody's ever lost a penny of an insured deposit and never will. So I think the FDIC has a very good, good brand and very strong record, but people had kind of forgotten. The, the banking industry had been healthy for so long. People had forgotten that sometimes banks do fail. So I think stepping up to the plate and making sure depositors, not only that their money was protected, but they had seamless access to their money was very important. And then I think just getting out there and being calm about it, right, and saying, you know, yes, there's a lot of stuff going on, but if you're insured, you really don't need to worry about it, so leave your money into the banks. Because if you leave, take your money outside of the banks, they can't take that money and make loans, and that's one of the problems we have now with credit availability. So. Uh, and we're, you know, we're, we're still right in the middle of the cleanup phase. There's still uh, more bank failures this year. It's still a small percentage of the overall number of banks, but we will have, uh, we are having, and we'll have more bank failures this year. But you know, that, I think people have become used to that. It is a non-event. We're religious about making sure people uh, have immediate access to their money, and uh, and for the most part, we're able to sell these institutions to healthier institutions on Friday. So you have, it's just like you know, the bank was acquired. You have uh, the same banking relationship with a new name. Uh, and probably better management, uh, but it really is a non-event. So um, I am very, you know, and that, that's not been easy. And we, or the staff has made it look easy, but we had to staff up very quickly. We went from 5,000 to 7,000 people in about 18 months. We're still hiring. You have send, send me some applications if you want. <laughs> Looking for good people, good business students out there. So, um, but it, it has been, uh, and just dealing with all of this, uh, and then being part of the policy debate now on how to fix it is, is very, uh, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. Uh, Chairman Barrett, you've got a number tonight, a number of KU students okay. who are sitting here listening. Um, you went to, to, you graduated from school here, graduated from law school here. You've gone and made a difference in your, uh, in your life. What would you say to the KU students here tonight that they can do with their education? Well, they can do a lot with their education. And I, I would say, uh, you know, uh, 
find out what it is uh, that, that you find rewarding, that you're good at, you find rewarding, and then, then go and do it. You might have to take uh, jobs that will be stepping stones uh, to that. So you need to be flexible, especially in this job market, and realistic. But I think identifying what you want to do and what you're good at and doing it is very important. I would also say, though, that I hope that, you know, I think one of the lessons of this crisis is, is that, you know, money, is, money is, is something, and it's important to all of us. But, you know, presenting, producing something of value, I think, is more important. And, I, I, you know, so I, I hope that, uh, you know, just in terms of business ethics or corporate ethics now, I, I think a lot of the uh, um, large financial institutions in particular lost sight. Uh, it's almost like uh, compensation became divorced from, from producing things of value. And, and so I think, you know, the true reward, I think, comes uh, from uh, doing something that is helpful to your country, to your economy. And if you make money, that's fine. I'm, making money is good. I'm a capitalist. But I think there, there's, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. You know, and, 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 uh, and so getting paid a lot, uh, even though uh, you're creating risk and your institution's in trouble or you're, you're giving people loans or credit products that they don't afford and can't, they don't understand and can't afford, that's the wrong way to do it. So I, I hope in that regard you'll be better uh, than, than some, uh, some have been in this crisis. And uh, so I think... Uh,